This month's podcast features Bill Thrash, station manager of the Oklahoma Educational Television Authority. Mr. Thrash recently recalled the history of the Western Heritage Awards at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum. Mr. Thrash was a member of the volunteer committee that helped organize this prestigious event. The mission statement that was designed in 1961, four years before the Cowboy Hall of Fame opened, says in order to give recognition to those who are making outstanding contributions to a fuller understanding and appreciation of this nation's great Western heritage, the trustees of the National Cowboy Hall of Fame and Western Heritage Center have established the Western Heritage Awards. Awards will be made in the fields of television, motion pictures, writing, and musical composition, 1961. And that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, in that mission statement, there's no mention of literature. So I don't know when that kicked in. But I did hear about the 61 uh, version of the Western Heritage Awards because I moved to Oklahoma City in 62 and people were already starting to talk about it. Uh, the Cowboy Hall of Fame was not constructed yet, but people uh, including Ray Ackerman, Glenn Ferris of the Chamber, Joe Jerkins of Channel 4, and several others came up with this idea, let's have an awards ceremony. Because go back into the early 60s, and this started in the late 50s, remember how many westerns were on television and how many westerns were still being made uh, for theaters uh, at one time and it might have been about this time about 59 or 60 there were 100 westerns on the three major television networks and uh, that's that's a lot of different shows and so westerns were big they were uh, on the top of everybody's uh, mind at the time. So there came the first uh, award ceremony and it was at the Municipal Auditorium before it was remodeled in 67 and called the Civic Center. It was the Municipal Auditorium. It seated almost 6,000 people and they did everything there. So in 61 they were in, uh, involved in doing this first ever event and the main entertainment of the evening for that event was the Lawrence Welk Show. And that was their ABC television network affiliate connection that made that happen, primarily because of the general manager, Ben K. West. So that was the first show, and there are pictures that show Welk performing, and that show was extremely popular in 1961 on ABC. That was the first one, and one of the awards I know was given to Death Valley Days uh, that year. So then it started, and then uh, as the next two or three years happened, um, I became more and more involved in the committee, and this volunteer committee was responsible for producing the event. Well, during the 60s, the event was either held at the Municipal Auditorium or the Persian Room of the Skirvin Tower Hotel. It's a real nice room that uh, the event was held there. Remember, the hall was not completed yet. And in 63, I believe was the year that uh, Rawhide won and Clint Eastwood was here that year and that was at the Municipal Auditorium, I remember that. But in 65, the big year was the opening of the Cowboy Hall of Fame. And the big attraction of that was John Wayne and he led the parade on his horse in downtown Oklahoma City, down Main Street. About 1970, the uh, awards ceremony moved out to the Cowboy Hall of Fame. And it was in Founders Hall, uh, which is now located in the vicinity of the town. And 70 was the year because it was always based on the previous calendar year. It was the year that True Grit won. And it was kind of a controversial year because at that time, the committee sort of watched the television and the movies and the music where the judges kind of did the literary work. And uh, so 
that year it was controversial because we had two good theatrical movies to choose from. One was True Grit and the other one was Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And we could only have one winner. So True Grit won. So the power of John Wayne kind of came through. There were some that thought cinematically Butch Cassidy really had it because it was a little new and different. So I remember that year. So one thing I want to mention now is the music, and this is something that has changed through the years. But in the 70s, there were still great theatrical motion pictures being made. And so we wanted our affair at the time to have an Academy Awards Oscar feeling and, and be more like that and have an orchestra. So we had um, uh, 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 orchestra on stage. Our musical director was the late Dr. Ray Luke from the Oklahoma City Philharmonic and the players from the Oklahoma City area that made up the orchestra. And f during the 70s, every year, the winners of that music award, for the most part, were motion picture scores. And that involved uh, well-known people like uh, Elmer Bernstein, John Williams, before Star Wars. He was uh, the Cowboys, great Western score. And other people like uh, uh, Dimitri Tiomkin for the Alamo and uh, other things like that. And uh, John Williams and Dominic Frontieri, Alex North, David Rose for Little House on the Prairie. Michael Small for Comes a Horseman uh, with Farnsworth, you know, that great film. And uh, so these guys would come in uh, to conduct our orchestra of the winning piece. So that was sort of the centerpiece of the music. Well, then in the 80s, that started to change. Fewer Western films, fewer original scores, and it changed to the more traditional music and the cowboy music and songs of the West. And that's really kind of continued up even till now. That's in the mid 70s, Tommy Alsup uh, produced the last Bob Wills album called Bob Wills for the Last Time. It was recorded in Fort Worth. Bob Wills was still living, but he was in a hospital in a coma right after that recording session. So when that album came out, it won a Grammy and I, had it at, uh, I was Channel 4 at the time, and I thought, we've got to do something with this. We hadn't done much with records or recordings at that time. So all the original players that were on that album came in uh, to be here that night and to perform, and uh, they were all here except Merle. And uh, Merle was booked somewhere, he was really active at that time, but. Uh, what a great album that was and how great they were. And the award was presented to them by Gene Autry. During those 70s, our MCs generally were either Joel McRae or Walter Brennan or Gene Autry. And uh, they would do a great job and we, we didn't have a teleprompter, but we had script and they would read and they added such a class to the evening because of who they were. Brennan, three-time Oscar winner, and uh, then Joel. And they were on the board and very active, especially Autry, uh, before he, he moved uh, his interest to California and, and started his own wonderful museum out there. And when uh, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans were inducted into the Great Hall of Western Performers, uh, Joel McRae made that presentation and read a great letter from Gene Autry that uh, congratulated them and uh, Time Magazine wrote that up that week that that had happened. And then a couple years later, Roy and Dale came back for their unveiling of their portrait. Another thing that we did back in that era is that we always closed our show with a, a, a little speech by the old Western cowboy, the voice of Walter Brennan. And Nora Owens, local uh, advertising uh, producer writer, 
wrote this piece that concluded with, and I was very proud to be in your company tonight. <clears throat> so we knew that we wanted Walter to read this. And Walter in real life had a clipped Eastern accent. That's the way, he's from Maryland and that's the way he talked and everything's just so wonderful and he talks real fast. So, uh, okay, here we go. And he knew what he wanted to do and so he starts reading the piece that we're gonna do. And he said, I have gone over the thing before in the West and the Great Plains and he didn't have a voice that he could do. So he gets through it all time one. Cut, perfect, print it. Thank you so much. Well, let me try that again. Well, I was ready to leave. It was so wonderful. Ten takes later, in each take, he got into it more and more and more. This podcast is a companion to our quarterly publication, Persimmon Hill Magazine. It's a great resource for keeping you in touch with our great Western heritage and is available by subscription. Visit nationalcowboymuseum.org for details. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.